You made it to church today, for which we are very thankful for. Um, I don't know how you got here, whether it was a 4x4, a snowmobile, ice skates, snowshoes, but you're here. And uh, we, we had a busy day yesterday just considering and contemplating what we're going to do for church today. But as you could see, so glad that we decided to have church. And so, amen, right? Uh, but hopefully not too many injured shoulders and backs out there from all the snow shoveling. I mean, it's been a, a crazy couple of weeks. And so, um, you know, a lot of churches have mission statements, but I, I used to be a physical therapist. And so we kind of had a mission statement, too. Uh, we actually liked these storms when they would show up because it meant more patience. But we would say, hurt yourself, support your therapist. OK, so uh, just kidding on that. Uh, hopefully you guys have been safe. Um, but uh, we had a pretty busy week, did we not, right? Uh, uh, who was excited about the snow day from Wednesday, right? All the students that are in here, yeah, of course. And so, uh, but I also understand that last week was kind of the first week for many to get back into the swing of things. Maybe if you took some time off for the holidays, uh, you had to wake up a little bit earlier, get back into the grind. And so I understand if there are some droopy eyelids out there as well. I'll do my best to keep things as interesting as possible today. It is the book of Romans, and so it is jam-packed. It's kind of like we're trying to just stuff things into a suitcase with these messages, and then, you know, how they have that little zipper that expands. That's kind of what we're doing with uh, going through this book. But one more thing. I think I have a slide of this when we were talking about uh, whether or not to have church today, right? Uh, anybody actually been in a game like that? Right. And so I have, uh, you know, Bears Packers, I think it was 2007. It was negative 40 degrees at Soldier Field. And so we braved it. And of course, the Bears lost. OK, so uh, but that's just pretty much par for the course. But Lake Michigan, uh, it truly feels like negative 40. That's not Lake Michigan, but we did find that. I think Brian sent that to me. But but again, you guys are here. So how amazing is that? But if you were with us last week, um, we had uh, our kickoff We the preface or the introduction to the book of Romans, and um, this great and, and mighty book. And, and we took some time to consider uh, how the book of Romans really was uh, influential as far as the history of the church is concerned. It was not only behind some of the revivals and reformations of uh, our church and its history, but also behind the conversions of the likes of St. Augustine or St. Augustine and, and Martin Luther and, and John Wesley. Uh, we also took some time uh, last week to really ask ourselves this question of what does the book of Romans mean for Redeemer Church? And we came up with a, a mission statement through the book of Romans, if you will. We also talked about the first word of the first verse of the first chapter of the book of Romans, and that is the word Paul. And we talked about two things as it pertains to Paul. And the first one was that he was a chosen instrument. We know that the Lord spoke to Ananias through a vision that he was to go talk to Paul and, and tell him what the Lord's plans were for him. And the Lord told Ananias that go for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name to the Gentiles, uh, to uh, the, the people, the children of Israel, and, and to kings. And Paul was able to do this because he was uniquely and particularly chosen by God. You see, if we remember, Paul was a Jew. He was also a Greek from the city of Tarsus and as well as a Roman citizen. And so in addition, we talked about Paul's conversion, this radical conversion. Remember, Paul was a violent persecutor of the church of God. And Paul was radically transformed. He was radically converted on the road to Damascus. And, and with that, we see Paul going from this persecutor, this violent persecutor of the Lord's church, uh, to the writer of the book of Romans, to, to the writer of 13 uh, epistles, to, to this prominent figure of the apostolic age. He, he was the church planter of all church planters. He, he planted 13 churches. And so this is a story of how God could take the chief of sinners and, and transform the chief of sinners into the most godliest, into the most greatest of saints. You see, the, the book of Romans, again, is Paul's theological testimony. In fact, the book of Romans is our testimony. It is how God, through the gospel 
of Jesus Christ has saved us. How he has delivered us. He has delivered us from the bondage of sin and death. And today, that's what we're going to be focusing on. The gospel. And this is Paul's primary focus in these first seven verses. Uh, the gospel of God, the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ. It, it is somewhat of a summative seven verses for the entire book of Romans. Because the entire book of Romans just keeps saying the gospel over and over again. And this is why we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about this today. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up the Romans. Doesn't that sound good? You better get used to it. If you have your Bibles, open up the Romans, chapter 1. We're going to be in verses 1 through 7 uh, today. And so this is what the Word of God has to say for us. Paul, a servant of, Jesus, of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son who is descended from David, according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God. In power according to the spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name. Among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and just ask him to bless our time together. God, we are just so thankful that uh, everyone is able to make it out here safely. And Lord, we pray that everyone is able to make it uh, safely home. Uh, but Lord, as we uh, look to your word today, uh, allow us to not only see this good news of the gospel, Lord, but that we could also see that this is not only good news, but this is the best of news. God, man, when we see this word gospel, we pray that we would know the weight and the magnitude and the substance of this word. God, God it is through the gospel of Jesus Christ in which we are saved. And it is through this gospel in which we are sanctified and secured. And God, we pray knowing that, Lord, that we will not just be complacent with it. But Lord, that we would proclaim and herald this gospel. Just as Paul does in our passage today. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. So as we see, it is the gospel that Paul leads out with in this book of Romans. It is the gospel that Paul concludes with in this book of Romans, in the, his doxology at the conclusion of chapter 16. He is referring to the gospel. It is the gospel that is the good news in this world that is completely full of bad news. It is the gospel that is the answer, uh, the antidote, the, the key, uh, the solution uh, to remedy, remedy man's greatest problem. And what is man's greatest problem? Well, that is his sin problem, his issue with sin. And this is important because you've probably heard this statement before at some point. We, we truly have to recognize how, how good the good news is, okay? And we're only able to do that if we truly embrace how bad the bad news is. And that's why Paul spends the first three chapters of the book of Romans talking specifically about man's greatest problem, and, and that's his sin problem. This is, it has colossal ramifications as far as eternity is concerned, uh, mankind's sin. It is man's sin that provides this separation, this chasm between sinful man and holy God. It is man's sin that creates this eternal separation between him and God. And this eternal separation means eternal separation from God in hell. It is man's sin that brings about the wrath of God. And this is so important because this is why the gospel of Jesus Christ takes front and center stage today. 
This is why the gospel of Jesus Christ is so important as far as how we live our lives, how we do church, what we study in his word. This is why the gospel of Jesus Christ is the centerpiece, the focal point, and the target and the bullseyes, bullseye of today's message. It is this good news, and that's what the, the word gospel means, un gelion. It is this good news that we're going to be breaking down today because in our passage, in these seven verses, Paul actually has six different aspects of the gospel that he wants to make us aware of. And the first one is the gospel was preached by Paul, and this is pretty obvious here. So Romans 1.1, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, Set apart for the gospel of God. Now, Paul was set apart for the gospel of God. Paul was set apart to preach the gospel of God. Uh, Last week, we spent a lot of time talking about Paul, looking at different areas throughout Scripture as far as describing this person. Uh, But today, we're just really going to stick with this verse, verse 1. We see right off the bat his introduction to us. He uses this word, servant. And, And now, this is very important. Because this word servant is his own recognition. These are the words that are leaving his pen. He is recognizing that he is no longer under his own authority. He is recognizing that he is under the authority of another. He recognizes the fact that he has been bought by God. He recognizes the fact that he is owned by God. He recognizes the fact that he is Ruled by God. Now, this word servant isn't necessarily the best translation that we have. Because in the Greek, this word servant is actually doulos. And doulos means a slave. One who is devoted to the directives of another while disregarding their own interests. Now, obviously we see the word servant because of the negative connotations Uh, that have been uh, throughout the last few centuries as far as this word slave is concerned. But Paul is not referring, as far as most commentators would agree, Paul is not referring to kind of a a day laborer or or just kind of like a, a house servant that could come and go as they please. Paul is using this word doulos because in the Roman Empire, in that day and age, there was indeed many slaves. And it was not a situation where they could just come and go as they please. They were indentured for life. These slaves, they were purchased. They were owned. And so when Jesus says to us, deny yourself and pick up your cross daily and follow me, Our own will, our own purposes, our own directives are no longer at the forefront. We are purchased, we are owned, we are bought by God. And when that transaction takes place, it is now the Lord's will, the Lord's purposes, the Lord's directives in which we have been redirected towards. And Paul recognized this. One of my favorite verses and I think one of the most powerful verses in all of scripture Galatians 2:20 I have been crucified with Christ it is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me in the life I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me 1 Corinthians 6:19 and 20 you are not your own. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. You see, we were not only bought with a price, but we were purchased with a blood bought price. At Calvary, Christ's blood was shed on the cross. And so may we always recognize and know that the cost that was paid for our eternal soul was very significant. And and knowing that, knowing that, we should recognize this word, do loss, and know that it is the Lord who is in the driver's seat. 
We do not steer the ship anymore. We indeed are a doulos of the Lord. We see that Paul also referred to himself as an apostle. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Now maybe a better rendering of this would be a, a called apostle. Why do I say that? Because Paul, he did not decide on doing this. He did not, you know, petition or, or you know, try to elect himself into this role. Uh, he did not have, he was not appointed to this role by the other apostles. He, he was divinely appointed. He was divinely called. He, he was divinely chosen by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Remember from last week, for he is a chosen, chosen instrument of mine. And this word in the Greek, apostolos, it means one who is sent. And now from a general perspective, we actually all are referred to as apostles because um, we are all sent. We have all uh, been sent to share the gospel, uh, to fulfill the great commission. We've been sent to be a witness of Jesus Christ. But now, an easy differentiation with this would be that with us being apostles, we would be considered a lowercase apostle, okay? But Paul is referring to himself here as an uppercase uh, apostle. And and what do we mean by that? This would consist uh, of the 12 disciples, including Matthias, who was appointed after Judas hung himself, And then Paul, so that would make a total of 13. Now, an important aspect, one thing to consider as far as a qualifying aspect for capital A apostleship would be that they had witnessed the resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ. And Paul indeed had on the road to Damascus. He he was radically converted. He came face to face with Jesus Christ. Paul, Paul, who, Saul, Saul, who are you persecuting? And this is where Paul came face to face with Jesus Christ. In addition, these men that Christ specifically chose and commissioned to proclaim the gospel and to also lead the early church. And this is important because when Paul was writing this letter of Romans, when Paul was writing any of his epistles, his writings and these letters were considered to have apostolic authority. These words were authoritatively binding over the church, the dispersed church of Rome, and also authoritatively binding to all the churches, not only back then, but also today. If we look to Ephesians, uh, the church uh, was built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Jesus Christ being the cornerstone. And that's what it would mean if we were to say we are an apostolic church. That that means we come under uh, the teachings of the apostles with Jesus Christ being the cornerstone, Jesus Christ being the head of the church. And so if you're at church and and someone comes and rolls up to you and says, hello, um, I just wanted to let you know that I am the Apostle John, okay, Uh, you might want to find a new church, okay? So we're we're not going to talk about the new apostolic reformation, the NAR, uh, that's for another day, but it is important to recognize that Paul is recognizing himself as one of the disciples that had been clearly commissioned by God, who had witnessed the resurrection and has apostolic authority over the church. And so, verse 1 in summary, this is the gospel that was preached by Paul. It was brought to us by a servant who was bought by Christ, an apostle called by Christ, and a man who was set apart by Christ. And so if we look to verse 2, we could see that this gospel, this gospel was promised by God. This gospel was promised by God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son. You see, the gospel is not some contrived um, fictitious, fabricated creation of man as many of the world's religions find their origin in. Nor does some revision or redirection of God. God has never been at a place where he's wringing his hands 
and saying, I hope it works out for the Israelites. And to say like, well, I'm just going to redirect things and allow the Gentiles to come into the fold. That's not how God works in his sovereignty. That's not how God works in his immutability. God never changes, and because God never changes, neither do his purposes, his will, or his directives. God is immutable, and his purposes are immutable. He he always follows through and and will do what he has promised. He will always do what he has covenanted. But remember, Paul was a Jew, Jew, a Jew who trained under the great rabbi Gamaliel. And he knew the arguments that his Jewish dissidents would be bringing against him. Uh, because he was uh, the, the Hebrew of Hebrews. He, he already knew where to go as far as defending his faith. Defending Christianity. Defending being a follower uh, of Jesus. And so this is very important because this is why Paul references the Old Testament So many times throughout his letters, so many times in the book of Romans, we talked about 63 to 88 times Paul references the Old Testament in the book of Romans. He knew how important it was to look back to Old Testament prophecies and to validate the fact that Jesus Christ was indeed the fulfillment of these prophecies. You see, the good news, the gospel, it is not new news. It's actually old news. The gospel never changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament. The gospel was always same, the same from the Old Testament to the New Testament. You, you see, the gospel is meticulously, providentially, sovereignly intertwined throughout the Old Testament. And it is completed and comes to full fruition in the person of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. And it is these prophecies found in these holy scriptures that we know were fulfilled and completed by Jesus Christ and through Jesus Christ. What does Christ himself tell us in Matthew 5, 17 and 18? He's talking about the law and the prophets. He's talking about the Torah. He's talking about the Nevi'im, the, the writings of the prophets. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. All I have set out to do is accomplished. And so it's important to recognize that we do not have a faith. That the gospel is not separated by the Old and New Testament. It is very important to recognize this as it pertains to how we view Judaism. Because our religion, Christianity, was birthed out of Judaism. The Old Testament is Judaism. The first five books of the Bible, the the Torah, the the books of the prophets, the Nevi'im, the books of the writings, the Ketuvim, all three of these being combined into the Jewish Bible, the Tanakh. In the Jewish Bible, folks, as we know, is our Old Testament. And so our prayer and gospel witness, as far as if we're sharing the gospel with Jewish people, it shouldn't be that we should ask them to change their religion What we should be praying and witnessing towards is that Jewish people would indeed complete their religion. Complete their religion by recognizing that Jesus Christ is the prophesied messianic savior of the world. That the Bible, Travis and I were just kind of discussing this and he brought up this which I I loved. That the Bible wouldn't stop here. But that the Bible would stop here. That we would take Old and New Testament and combine this and and recognize that this gospel in which we are talking about today has been meticulously interwoven through the Old Testament. And now the gospel comes to completion, comes to fruition in the New Testament. Because remember, 
a little bit later in this chapter, chapter 1, verse 16, that the gospel, what does it say, is for the Jew first and then also to the Greek, with the Greek being considered Gentiles, all of us. So evangelism to, to Jewish people, it, it looks the same as it does to anyone else. We need to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And sure, it would be great to have an apologetic argument that, that really connects all of the dots as far as a prophecy fulfilled from the Old Testament in the person of Jesus Christ. But it really comes down to the same issue with a, with a, a Mormon, with a Jehovah Witness, with an atheist, with any other world religion out there. It comes down to the same issue. What will you do with Jesus? Is he your Lord? Is he your Savior? And it's the same question that we have to ask ourselves. So if you wanted that whole conversation as far as Israel to continue, you know, the nation of Israel, the remnant of believers, the partial hardening, hardening the us being grafted in, how the nation of Israel relates to us and, and as a church and to end times. Well, we're going to get to that in Romans 11. And uh, that'll probably be sometime in 2034. So, so <laughs> just kidding. Um, but Randy Newman, a Christian apologist, states this in his book, engaging with Jewish people, understanding their world, sharing the good news, he states this as far as stepping into engaging with Jewish people. Step into the process of engaging with Jewish people, understanding their world, and share the good news, the gospel, and watch God do the impossible. So a little bit of a rabbit trail there, but I thought it was just a, a good inlay into, into that. Uh, but as we see, this whole premise of prophecy being fulfilled, it continues into point three and continues into verse three. Point number three is this. The gospel was prophesied by men, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son who is descended from David according to the flesh. Now, what are some of these prophecies that Paul is referring to? Well, if you're with us during our Ecclesia sermon series is one of our first sermon series. We had a message called The Glory of Christ where we identified nine different tenets as far as um, Jesus Christ actually being who he said he was, uh, the Son of God. Remember, he was not a liar, he was not a lunatic, but he was and is God. Lewis's trilemma. But what we talked about specifically is 300 to 450 messianic prophecies from the Old Testament being fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, we're only going to merely scratch the surface on uh, a couple of these as it relates to verse 3. But what does verse 3 state? Concerning his son who descended from David according to the flesh. Now, remember, Paul is continually quoting Old Testament scripture 63 to 88 times in the book of Romans. But where is it specifically that Paul is pulling this being descended from David according to the flesh? Where, where is he grabbing this prophetic fulfillment uh, from? Well, here Paul is referring to what we would know and what we have now identified as the Davidic covenant. And what would the Davidic covenant be referring to? So this is the unconditional covenant made by God to David and the nation of Israel that the Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah, the line of David. And from this, the Lord would establish a kingdom that would endure forever. That the Savior would come from the line of David. And this is the summary of what is found in 2 Samuel 7 when the prophet Nathan is speaking from the Lord specifically to David. This is where the Davidic covenant is originated out of. He states this, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Forever. You see, the Messiah will establish his throne 
of his kingdom forever. No man could do that. And notice that Paul uses also this word prophets, plural. He doesn't say the prophet Nathan from 2 Samuel. He actually uses the word prophets. And this is also reinforced in, in 1 Peter when the apostle Peter is saying that the prophets searched and inquired carefully uh, about the person and, and the time in regards to the sufferings and subsequent glories of Christ. But he uses the word prophets. And so we could see this to be a recurring theme to reinforce what would later be known as the Davidic covenant. Jeremiah 23, 5, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. This righteous branch shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. Isaiah eleven ten. In that day, the root of Jesse, who, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire and his resting place shall be glorious. So two prophetic prophecies, two, that's not a word, two prophecies that were fulfilled in, in Jesus Christ. And this is also, if we were to look at the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, and he really right off the bat brings things full circle in, in verse 1, chapter 1. And he talks about the genealogy of Jesus Christ, starting with Abraham, through David, and to Jesus Christ. Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of David, the son of Abraham. You see, all of the promises of God, according to 2 Corinthians 1.20, all of the promises of God are what? Yes. Yes in him. Yes in in Jesus Christ. All of the promises of God are yes in Jesus Christ. And so when we see things such as this, such as prophecy being fulfilled, it should serve to validate and substantiate our faith. It is of utmost importance. This is pure evidence. Evidence that demands a verdict, right? Prophecy fulfilled equals truth Revealed. And we've said that before and we'll say it again. It should strike a chord with us when we see prophecy such as this fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. And, and Paul wants to make it abundantly clear you know, that it is not the prophecies, it, it, is, it is not the prophets, it is Jesus Christ who, who is the source, who is the substance, who, who is the subject of the gospel. Everything rises and falls with the person of Jesus Christ, his crucifixion, his resurrection, what he was able to do. And one of the reasons that Christ was able to do this, we find this in the midst of this passage. Just You could easily gloss over it, but we're going to camp out here just for a second. It's somewhat of a sandwich, if you will. And I don't know if you guys are hungry. Travis, you're probably really hungry right now from all that snow removal you're doing. Stefan kind of came up a little bit later and kind of finished things off while everyone was driving in here. So, hey, it's look Stefan, but just make no mistake, you know, Travis was at it for a while. Uh, so is Dan Sweet. Uh, but, <laughs> but what this sandwich is, is it's speaking into the duality of Christ's humanity and his deity. Okay? Big word alert coming up. I did not know this was going to be a family service when I wrote the message this past week, okay? So kids, if you use this word at some point, like around adults, and you actually explain what it means, you're going to be like, whoa, we've got a little theologian on our hands, all right? So big word alert coming up, hypostatic union. And the doctrine of, now I said doctrine, the doctrine of the personal union of two natures, deity and and humanity into the one person of Jesus Christ. Now, here's the sandwich. Romans 1, 3 through 4, B, concerning his son. Son being a, a title. The son of God is a title of deity who is descended from David according to the flesh, humanity, and again was declared to be the son of God 
deity. You see, Jesus descended from David according to the flesh. Uh, Other versions would actually say he was born a descendant of David, both speaking into his humanity, uh, both speaking into the incarnation, God coming down as flesh, according to John 1. And then before this, he's referred to as God's son, concerning his son. And after this, he was declared to be the son of God. And this title, again, son of God, is referring to deity. And so why is this doctrine of the hypostatic union important to us? Well, we've got to just kind of track here a little bit. God, God is immortal. God cannot die. God had to come down as a man, humbling himself, taking on flesh through the incarnation to die a sacrificial sin on the cross. And now when he came down, he was not stripped of his deity, but all the while Christ was fully God and fully man. And and Christ was not just any man. He was the, the man. The man that led a perfect life, a sinless, blameless, perfect life, the perfect Lamb of God. And he was the only one worthy, as we talked about at Christmas Eve, the only one worthy to take on this sacrifice, to take on the wrath of God. And all of these things, they point to the substitutionary atonement, that there indeed is a penalty that must be paid. A penalty for the sins of mankind. A penalty for our own sin. What are we told? The wages of sin is death. And in order for this debt to be paid, in order for this debt to be paid in full, there had to be a payment for the sin. It was either to go to us or it was to go to the Son of God. And so even though we could easily gloss over this, I think that Paul knew exactly what he was doing when he was talking about this duality of Christ's nature, his humanity and deity as far as a doctrinal truth. And I say doctrinal because this has been on the docket since the beginning of church history. This is one of the aspects as far as fully man, fully God, Christ's deity at the ecumenical council of Nicaea in 325 AD. So, so it's of great importance. And a few months ago, and I think this is interesting for if you want to take a creative point of view to the hypostatic union. A while back, my son, Mason, he's a big history buff, but he told me about this painting, and many of you guys may be familiar with it. I wasn't at the time, but it's one of the first depicted portraits of Jesus Christ. Now, depicted, it, there wasn't anyone, you know, making a portrait of him when he was uh, alive. But it's from the 6th century called Christ uh, Pantocrator. Christ Pantocrator. And Pantocrator essentially just means ruler over all. Uh, but this picture, as we see, is very unique. Or this, this portrait, this depiction is very unique. Because if you notice that both sides of his face look a little bit different uh, on Uh, the right side uh, of his face, we see more of a a stern, a a sense of consternation. And this would be referring to to God and maybe uh, his judgment. And and then on the left side uh, of the picture, we see his humanity, uh, more softer, if you will. And there's all kinds of symbolism, if any of you wanted to take a deep dive. But I think this next picture just kind of shows the the difference that you could see if you were to, you know, computer generate it into as far as both sides looking the same. And so I thought that was great, uh, uh, just kind of cool, just to uh, throw that out there. So, uh, But all that to say, uh, Paul was bookending uh, with the tail end of this sandwich with, again, the deity uh, of Jesus Christ. And he starts off uh, Romans uh, verse 4 and 5 with this. And, and he was declared to be the Son of God in power, Uh, according to the spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through him we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among the nations. And make no mistake, 
Paul here is proclaiming the gospel. He, he is heralding who Jesus Christ is. And let me just reread verse 4. And was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by His resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Christian, we do not proclaim and herald the name of a dead prophet. We do not proclaim and herald the name of a dead Jew. We proclaim and herald the name of a resurrected king. He is declared the Son of God in power. Why? Because of the resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, the Messianic King, conquered the grave, rose again in victory, and is now seated at the right hand of God. He is now far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, not only in this age, but the one to come. Jesus Christ came into this world fully God, fully man, and he died. But he rose again, and behold, he is alive forevermore. This verse, I wish we could spend a little bit more time on it, but it has so many ramifications as far as the, the Trinity, as far as Jesus Christ is concerned. This is the Apostle John in his vision for the book of Revelation. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me saying this, Fear not. I am the first and the last. A, a reference that God uses. I am the first and the last and the living one. But what does he say next? I died. I died. God died through the person of Jesus Christ. And, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. And praise the Lord for this. May we take this gospel and proclaim it with power to the nations, just as it says at the end of verse 5, for the sake of his name among all the nations. Point number four is this. The gospel was and is proclaimed with power to the nations. And we're to do this through the obedience of our faith for the sake of his name. And so may we be a people, may we be a church that regularly asks ourselves, how are we not only sharing the gospel? And it is my hope and our prayer that through the book of Romans, at a bare minimum, we will all be able to be a witness, to be able to adeptly share the gospel of Jesus Christ, to a world that is in such a desperate need of this. We will not only be able to do this here in Eagle, Idaho, but for some, may we be called to do this to all the nations. To all the nations. And so finally, let's land this plane, a final point of application. What is it that, the, the fifth thing that we receive from the gospel and all P's today, folks, the gospel is a privilege we receive. A privilege we receive. Yes, we have the richest gift, the richest privilege, which is our salvation. But through that and in that, we have been given privileges here in verses 6 and 7, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. And what are these privileges? We belong to Jesus. Take that. Don't just let it gloss over you. You belong to Jesus. He is the Lord and creator of the universe. And we belong to him. We are loved by God and we are called to be his saints. And so as Paul concludes his first introduction of the gospel, 
And as we conclude our first introduction to the gospel through the book of Romans, he has a final benediction, and we have a final benediction. Romans 1, 7b. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, again, we are so thankful to just be able to meet, not neglecting to meet with one another, not forsaking the assembly, Lord. But Lord, we love to come into your house and worship you. And God, may our time together be a sweet time of fellowship. And God, we're so thankful for the so many people that allowed today to happen. God, may we just go and God, just be able to know and understand God, that you are great and mighty. And we could see your imprint all throughout Scripture, Lord. Uh, that we don't take it lightly, Lord, that it may indeed empower our bold witness for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God, we thank you. May you receive all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. Amen.